Well, welcome everyone to Family Talk, which is a division of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm James Dobson, and I think we're going to be talking about a subject today that might hit pretty close to where you live. Most of us have been wounded or insulted or rejected at one time or another by someone that we thought we could trust. That's just the way it is. It often involves a person very close to us, such as a mother or father, or a son or daughter, or perhaps a husband or a wife. In fact, the closer we are to the offender, the more devastating it is to be hurt or wounded or rejected. Unless you learn to deal with that experience, the result often is bitterness and anger that can last for a lifetime. I'll bet some of you who are listening right now are thinking, yeah, that's me. If you've experienced that kind of pain, our program today is designed for you, and I hope and we just prayed that you will find it helpful. Our guest today is Lisa Turkhurst, who has an organization called Proverbs 31, which seeks to lead women into a deeper relationship with Jesus. She is a much-loved author who has sold more than six million books, and we're going to talk about two of them today. The first came out in 2018 and is titled, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. And the subtitle is Finding Unexpected Strength When Disappointments Leave You Shattered. A more recent book on a similar subject is Forgiving What You Can't Forget. What a great title that is. And we're going to talk about those two books together. Lisa not only writes about painful experiences in others, but she has lived some of them herself. In fact, the books seem to me to be autobiographical in nature, and we'll probably find that out in a minute or two. Lisa is going to be joining us by telephone, and uh, I say to you, Lisa, it's an honor to have you with us. Well, thank you. It's such an honor to be with you today, Dr. Dobson. Um, Let me jump right into it. I want to start with this question. Your book, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way, was a national bestseller for 18 weeks and has sold so far 900,000 copies. It is very obvious that you hit a raw nerve there. Uh, Summarize that book for us. What isn't supposed to be that way? Well, I think most of us have an expectation of how our life is going to go. And we love to run into the future and dream up the way things are going to look. But then when we actually arrive to that place and our experience falls way below what our expectation was, the fertile ground that that is in between our expectations and our experiences is disappointment. And disappointment can really grow a lot of skepticism, a lot of cynicism, frustration, maybe even anger. And, you know, I think the heartbreak that can come from that when the devastation or the disappointment is in our human relationships is is pretty big. So that's what happened to me. I have put a lot of emphasis on treasuring my family and honoring God and, and doing all that I felt like I could do to protect my marriage. And then we got two and a half decades in and our five kids were grown. And when my last child packed her things to move out, um, so did my husband and I was just absolutely caught off guard and heartbroken. Lisa, I want to know a whole lot more about that uh, as we go along. But let me ask you this. You are speaking now to thousands upon thousands of women. When they come out to hear you speak and then they talk to you at break time or half time or whenever it is, do you find most of them have been heartbroken at one time or another? Unfortunately, yes. There's just a lot of heartbreak. And even if their story isn't the same as mine, you know, part of my story was that I discovered my husband was being unfaithful. And that's not the reason that that everyone goes through heartbreak and hardship in relationships and in marriages. But unfortunately, I do think that the enemy is on an all out assault against the family. And Satan absolutely hates the institution of marriage. 
Yeah, but in addition to that, we human beings are very vulnerable emotionally. I think women much more than men. And most of us bump our heads on the same old rock. Yeah, and I think, you know, when hurt sits unattended so long in the human heart, it turns into versions of hate. And then, you know, it just is a spiraled compounding effect, you know, and, and I think the devastation runs deep. And I think we are living the fruit of a lot of unattended to hurt right now when we we can just turn on the news and see it seems like the whole world is epically offended by everything. And there are a lot of wrongs and there are are a lot of injustices, but God has also given us this beautiful plan to yes. tend to the hurt in our heart. And that's really what drives me to tell my story. It's not fun to tell this story. And I really applaud my husband for being brave enough to want to see God take some of the painful things that we've walked through and, and use it for his good. But I, I'm passionate about this. My family's passionate about this, not because we're eager to expose the most painful things that we've been through, but because we're so eager to help other people. Well, you have told me that we can get personal here uh, because you're going to kind of open your story for people to hear so they can understand where you've been. But uh, you've indicated in your book that there was infidelity in your marriage. How did you survive that? It was a long journey. It was not a short one. I, I would love to say that it was a you know, discovery and then quick healing and reconciliation and a redemption. And, you know, I love that story. That was not our story. It was a very long journey. And there were some addictions involved that complicated things. So my husband did not live in our home for over two and a half years. Hmm. And, um, you know, for the purpose of our interview, we're having to kind of clip right along here. But I don't want to brush over that fact because two and a half years of you know, going to bed by myself, reaching over across the the covers to my husband that used to be there for so long, my whole adult life. And all of a sudden he's not there and having to wake up in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. And, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. devastating. And there's so many people that are there right now. And it's so hard. How did you find out about what he was doing? Well, it was a series of finding small things. And I think as a Christian wife, I kept trying to override what I was seeing because I wanted to believe the best. I wanted to speak words of life and encouragement. And all of those are great principles in a marriage. But there also has to be a time where we're really honest with what we see. And so um, I eventually confronted him. And and that's how I found out. And it was really devastating. How close were you all to divorce during that time? Well, after 18 months of doing a lot of intensive counseling, things imploded again. And there were five different times I thought we were about to cross the finish line and renew our vows, and then things would fall apart again. So after 18 months, I finally went to my husband and I just said, I can love you and I can forgive you, but I will not share you. And I drew a very hard line. And actually your book, it's an oldie, but it's such a goodie. Love must be tough. That book helped me so much. And I Mm. really followed the advice that you gave in that book. And I, I wrote a letter of, um, just setting my husband free. And I'm telling you, I would recommend that book to every single person going through something so hard because you unpacked so beautifully just the reality of the human dynamic. It was never going to work if I just begged him to stay. The only thing that ever worked is when I set him free and I released him to face the full weight of the consequences of his choices. And eventually, and it was a long season of eventually, but eventually he came back and he did the hard work, the humble work of winning my heart back and the slow Mm. work of putting our marriage back together. You know, I've written 71 books now, and I think I've received more mail from Love Must Be Tough, which you mentioned, than any of my other books. And it relates to marriages that are in the process of breaking up. And I have had literally thousands of people who have written me, most of them women, but some of them men, who have said, you saved my marriage. 
it's very gratifying to me uh, because there are some principles that determine whether or not a marriage that's breaking up can be saved or whether it is doomed. Nearly always in the marriage that's in that kind of trouble, there is one partner who wants out and is looking for a way to escape. In fact, the infidelity may be an expression of that uh, desire to get away, to escape. The other partner is absolutely desperate because he or she is losing something that they can't contemplate life without. And it is begging and pleading and promising and trying to do anything, trying to get the partner to go to counseling, which is usually rejected. Um, They'll do anything to preserve the marriage. That response is called appeasement. Appeasement almost never works. The more you grovel, the more you drive the other person away. It's strange the way that works, but the principle is in love, you want what you can't have, and you tend not to want what you're stuck with. And so when one person builds a cage around the other, it makes them desperate to get away. And I think that might be relevant to your situation. That's exactly what I did. And, you know, I will say I um, also had the support of a counselor that helped me navigate some of the difficulties because, you know, when you draw a boundary like that, and I, and I do think in difficult relationships, boundaries are very important. They're not cruel. They're important because a boundary doesn't shove that other person away. For me, a boundary helps hold me together. Yes. And my children deserved a mom that didn't completely fall apart and fall into the pit of despair. And I could feel myself teetering on that edge because everything was so hard and so complicated. So I had a really good Christian counselor that was helping me. I also had some wise pastors that were helping me and I had to be firm. Um, I could be loving, but you know, Dr. Dobson, I found when I was giving too much grace, I was really enabling him and eventually that grace became disgusting to him. And I don't say that lightly. That feels a little shocking maybe to hear those two words together, but it, it is. And, you know, I think what God really started to show me is that I could be his wife, but I could not be his savior. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad that you found a counselor who understood the principles that I'm talking about and knew what to do because he gave you great advice. You know, the one who wants out has a totally different perspective. It goes from how do I get away to do I really want to leave? And it changes the whole perspective. The best way to save a marriage that is in this kind of trouble is to let go. It's to say, in effect, that you married me of your own free will and now you say you want to go. If you do, it will hurt me because I love you. I married you for life, uh, but you are free to go if that's your desire. Go on with your story now, Lisa, because it's relevant to so many people who are listening to us. Well, I remember I went to um, one of my counseling sessions after I had had the hard love must be tough conversation with my husband and that season was so hard. Um, but I will say when I had that conversation and I followed your advice in that, um, and I turned art over to his choices, that was the first time he checked himself into a treatment center and he stayed Mm -hmm. and he completed the program because it was of his own doing. Every other time I had checked him in, I had begged him to stay. I had tried to really prevent him from hitting rock bottom because I was so scared of all the consequences that would be unleashed that would deeply affect not only me, but also my children. And so that's what's so complicated in situations like this. So art was away at treatment and I went and and sat in front of my counselor, I was exhausted. It had been an 18 month battle at that point, though we'd held what we were facing in a private manner for very long. It was no longer possible to keep it private because things were leaking out. So I had to make a public statement and I was exhausted. 
I was afraid. I was alone. And I went and sat in front of my counselor. And I remember he looked at me and he said, do you want to heal, Lisa? And I said, I really do. I want to heal. And he said, then today's a good day to start working on forgiveness. And I thought, are you crazy? That's not possible. I don't know how the situation's going to turn out. I'm not done hurting yet. Art hasn't said he's sorry. And I don't even know that forgiveness is possible because I can't even have a conversation with him now. And everything I was saying, I was attaching my ability to heal on choices that art may or may not ever make. And my counselor really helped me understand that I deserved to stop suffering because of what had been done. And the Mm. only way to sever the source of suffering was to unhitch my ability to heal from his choices. I had to start understanding that forgiveness was as much for my heart as anyone else's. And it was a great first step of healing, but I Mm. couldn't start by just saying like, okay, what happened to me doesn't matter. I'll forgive because what happened to me did matter. So my counselor said, let's don't start with forgiveness. Let's start with your pain. And he had me write on three by five cards, all the ways that I had been so deeply wounded. And when I finished writing those cards, my counselor looked at me and he said, Lisa, what you have faced is so hard. And I want to acknowledge that I believe you. And Dr. Dobson, I guess I want to say that to someone who's listening today. I'm so sorry for what's been done to you. What happened, it was hurtful and it matters. Your pain is real. And if no one has ever dared to bear witness to your pain, I'll do that for you today. And I'm so sorry, friend, you do deserve to stop suffering because of what someone else has done to you. And it was at that point, my counselor looked at me and said, okay, Lisa, now just go card by card by card and just say, I forgive Art for this pain. And then he told me, add this statement at the end, and whatever my feelings will not yet allow for, the blood of Jesus will surely cover it. Because you see, sometimes Mm -hmm. our hurt feelings are the very last things that want to sign on to holy instructions. And if we have a right understanding of forgiveness, we start to see that We don't have to muster up the determination to forgive. Forgiveness is not based on our determination. Forgiveness is based on our cooperation with what God has already done. And as God's forgiveness flows to us, we simply cooperate with letting it flow through us to other people. And that's how I made the decision to forgive. I've also come to understand, Dr. Dobson, that forgiveness is both a decision and it's a process. So I don't know if you've ever had this situation happen in your life, but have you ever made the decision to forgive? And you really did have a marked moment of forgiveness where you said, I forgave. But then a week later, six months later, a year later, you get triggered by being reminded of the impact, the emotional cost that that had on you. I don't know. Have you ever gotten that where it's like, okay, I made the decision to forgive, but now I'm angry again. Oh, of course, because the memories are still there. That's right. I hope people will remember this. Feelings are involuntary. They're not always rational. And they show up in the midnight hours and are very difficult to control. And that's why continued counseling as a husband and wife is often helpful even though both the man and the woman are committed to the marriage. You can decide to forgive. In fact, you are required to as followers of Christ. You're commanded to do that. But you don't necessarily heal from all of the hurt. And you have to give yourself time to do that. Absolutely. And so that's why I have come to understand that forgiveness is a decision to forgive the fact of what happened. Like we must forgive for the facts of what happened, but then forgiveness is also a process where we learn to forgive for the impact that all of that situation or all of that hurt had on us. And the cost was great. But what I always want people to understand is if you make the decision to forgive, you are being obedient to God. The process of forgiving for the impact that that had on you, that's where God's mercy and grace comes in. And it's okay if that process takes you a lifetime. Uh, That is, uh, again, beautifully stated on page 20 of your book. uh, You talk about the idea of forgiving and forgetting is not biblical. 
you can forgive because that's a decision. Sometimes it takes a long time to forget. Now, I think people get confused because God says that he will forgive our sin and remember it no more and cast it to the depth of the you know, deepest sea. But um, it never says in the Bible that people are supposed to forget. And so sometimes I've encountered people, and that's why I even titled my book, Forgiving What You Can't Forget, because sometimes I've encountered people that say, I can't forget the pain, therefore I can't forgive. And so it was really important to me to untangle that false notion. So when I studied this, you know, I spent many, many, many hours with my counselor working through my own hurt, my own pain and taking my own journey of forgiveness. But I also spent over a thousand hours of theological study so that I could really understand what the Bible does say and what the Bible does not say about forgiveness. Lisa, did you really do that? I really did it. And there's a thousand actually kind hours of, in biblical yes. study. Yes. And actually, um, my theological director at Proverbs 31 Ministries, he says it was over 1500 hours. But I said, nobody's going to believe that. I, I got to back it down to a thousand hours. <laughs> so <laughs> if you ask him, he would say it was more. <laughs> well, you've been blessed to have some influential people in your life that help you get through this. How long were you separated? We were separated two and a half years. What really was the trigger that brought you back together? Well, you know, after I had that very hard, honest, love must be tough conversation. And again, I, I wish I had a dollar for every time I've recommended your book. I'd be a very wealthy <laughs> woman right now. Um, but I um, decided that I needed to have a break from all of the hardship and all of the hurt. And so I requested that we take a break from any communication for about eight weeks. And I needed to do that so that I could really focus on working on my side of the street because I knew that I needed to work on some things for myself. And I didn't want heartbroken Lisa to have to make decisions from this point on that that were going to, you know, affect me and my children for the rest of our lives. And I did not want a divorce. But at that point, the only thing that I knew to do is to just give Art what it appeared that his actions were saying that he wanted. But the state of North Carolina, you have to be separated for an entire year before you can get a divorce. And I'm so grateful, actually, that that is the law here in our state, because I think if I wouldn't have had that year of processing and praying and wrestling and watching to see if Art would you know, ever be willing to come back. If I didn't have that year, I may have rushed into something that, um, that could have made this situation even more yeah. complicated, but we took the time. And then what eventually caused art to come back is God gave him a series of dreams of what his life would be like without me. And I'm going to tell you, Dr. Dobson, I had made hundreds of suggestions to God of what God could do to bring art back. But God never listened to any of my suggestions, but he did have a plan and he did what only God could do. Lisa, this time has gone by so rapidly. It always does. But there are some programs that just demand a continuation of the conversation. And we're talking to people out there who have been so devastated by circumstances in life and by relationships with those they depended on, especially a spouse, that they're hanging on every word you're saying. So we must continue. And if you can spare the time, uh, let's go on talking about this next time. I think what you're saying is absolutely vital. You know, I do a lot of programs, probably, I think, something more than 8,000 broadcasts so far. And this one today, given the prevalence of divorce and separation, is just so common that we absolutely must talk some more. Can you stay with us? And we will continue this conversation right now on the phone. We'll let our listeners hear it next time. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, thank you for being with us for writing these books. Uh, the two that we're talking about, the first one is It's Not Supposed to Be This Way, 
and then the newer one, forgiving what you can't forget. We really want to get into the substance of that one. So stay where you are. We'll continue talking. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow for the continuation of this gripping and purposeful discussion about forgiveness. In the meantime, be sure to visit today's broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org to learn more about our guest, Lisa Turkhurst. She leads the thriving Proverbs 31 Ministries and is also a prolific writer, author, and speaker. On our website, we will also provide you with links to both of her popular books referenced in this program. So go now to drjamesdobson.org and then tap on the broadcast button. Thanks so much for listening today and for your consistent support of this ministry. I'm Roger Marsh, and I hope you'll be with us again next time for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.